Ja, schönen guten Abend, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. Ich freue mich sehr, in Linz zu unserem zweiten Event begrüßen zu dürfen. Mein Name ist Robert Pfalle, ich bin Philosoph und Lehrer hier in Linz an der Kunstuniversität Philosophie. Mein Gast heute Abend ist Thomas Fazi aus Rom, Journalist und Buchautor. Ich bin von der offenen Gesellschaft eingeladen worden, diese Vortragsreihe zu organisieren und zu konzipieren. Und aus meiner Sicht ist das ein Beweis dafür, dass die offene Gesellschaft ihren Namen verdient. Ich bin weder Mitglied der Liste Pilz noch der offenen Gesellschaft noch der Plattform, sondern ein Außenstehender und wurde als Experte sozusagen eingeladen, Vortragende zusammenzustellen, die in der Lage sind, die entscheidenden Fragen anzusprechen, über die man im Moment in Bezug auf Europa und die Politik der Europäischen Union nachdenken muss. Ein weiterer Beweis für die Offenheit der offenen Gesellschaft ist, dass sie bereit ist, auf Experten zu hören. Das ist im Moment, ja, wie Sie vielleicht wissen, nicht ganz selbstverständlich. Wir haben eine Bundesregierung, die der Meinung ist, Experten kann man sich entweder ersparen oder sie sind selber die Experten. Das ist hier anders. Hier können Experten zu Wort kommen und werden offenbar auch gehört von politisch Verantwortlichen. Das finde ich sehr beachtlich. Und ein dritter Punkt, der mit der Offenheit der offenen Gesellschaft zu tun hat, ist das, was ich versucht habe zurückzugeben für diese ehrenhafte Aufgabe. Ich habe mir gedacht, es ist das Beste, was ich in dieser Situation tun kann, dass ich Leute einlade, die der offenen Gesellschaft zu denken geben. Leute, Experten, die vielleicht nicht Positionen vertreten, die auf einer Parteilinie liegen, sofern es die überhaupt schon gibt, sondern Leute, die Positionen vertreten, die unter Umständen radikal sind und so prononciert und präzise, dass man sehr gut anfangen kann, über die Fragen nachzudenken und Leute, die in der Lage sind, genau die Fragen zu stellen, über die man im Moment nachdenken muss. Das war die Strategie der Einladung. Ich habe also versucht, ein paar Hauptthemen zu, anzuvisieren. Heute wird es hauptsächlich um Souveränität und die Frage der Gleichheit bzw. der wachsenden Ungleichheit in Europa gehen. Der nächste Vortragende wird der slowenische Philosoph Slavoj Žižek sein, der über die Frage spricht, welche soziale Ordnung brauchen wir in Europa und welche wünschen wir uns. Dann wird Ulrich Brandt, der Autor des Buches, die imperiale Lebensweise sprechen über die Frage, wie kann man eigentlich eine Umweltpolitik organisieren und wie müssen die gesellschaftlichen Verhältnisse aussehen, damit diese Umweltpolitik zustande kommt. Dann werden wir die Frage der Geschlechtergerechtigkeit thematisieren mit Svenja Flasspöhler, die das Buch »Die potente Frau« geschrieben hat zur Frage der Bildung und der Infantilisierung der Universitäten wird Frank Foredi zu Gast sein zur Frage der Demokratie in postdemokratischen Verhältnissen spricht die französisch-belgische Politologin Chantal Mouffe und über Freiheit, Religion und Sexualität, was darf man noch sagen, was kann man sagen und was wollen wir eigentlich tun, spricht Katrin Millet, französische Kuratorin und Schriftstellerin, die Sie vielleicht auch kennen von sowohl von ihrem sehr berühmten Buch »Das sexuelle Leben der Katrin M.« als auch vielleicht als Co-Autorin des berühmten Manifests über das Recht belästigt zu werden. Das war das Kontermanifest von 100 französischen intellektuellen Frauen und Feministinnen, eine radikale Antwort und Kritik an der MeToo-Bewegung. Das sind unsere Gäste. Zum Ablauf des heutigen Abends äh, habe ich mir gedacht, ich sage Ihnen vielleicht kurz auf Deutsch einige Worte zu dem, was dann den Vortrag von Thomas Fazi ausmachen wird, äh, sodass Sie sozusagen schon auf Deutsch ein bisschen eingestimmt sind in die Gedankenlinien des Vortrags. Äh, <lacht> Thomas Fazi wird dann ungefähr 40 Minuten einen äh, Vortrag halten und äh, wird dann, ich werde dann versuchen, die entscheidenden 
Thesen vielleicht noch mal kurz auf Deutsch zusammenzufassen, weil wir heute leider keine Simultanübersetzung zur Verfügung haben, aber so, dass Sie alle mit Sicherheit noch an Bord sind in einer Stunde, äh, werde ich versuchen, das auf Deutsch noch mal kurz zusammenzufassen und dann werden wir eine Diskussion in englischer Sprache führen. Wenn Sie möchten, können Sie die Fragen aber auch auf Deutsch stellen und ich werde sie dann gerne übersetzen. Ähm, Thomas Fazi hat zusammen mit William Mitchell, dem Ökonomen, den wir vor zwei Wochen in Wien zu Gast hatten, ein sehr einflussreiches Buch geschrieben, das für mich eines der besten politisch-ökonomischen Bücher ist, die ich in den letzten zwei, drei Jahren gelesen habe. Reclaiming the State, a progressive vision of sovereignty for a post-neoliberal world, heißt das Buch. Dieses Buch ist ein sehr lesbares Buch, Dokument einer Position, die im Moment immer einflussreicher wird. In der Ökonomie hat dieses Buch sehr entscheidend dazu beigetragen, dass eine internationale ökonomische Schule, wie wir in den Wissenschaften sagen, ein ganzes Paradigma entstanden ist. Es gibt hunderte Forscher, Spitzenforscher in der politischen Ökonomie, die im Moment beitragen zu einer neuen politisch-ökonomischen Theorie, die man als Modern Monetary Theory bezeichnet. Und Thomas Fazi und William Mitchell gehören zu den Gründern dieser Theorie. Und was sehr erfreulich ist, nicht nur in Österreich hört man auf Experten, sondern auch zum Beispiel in den USA. Und die neuen Hoffnungsträger der demokratischen Partei in den USA, wie zum Beispiel Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, die sehr junge Senatorin, von der Sie vielleicht schon gehört haben, die leider noch zu jung ist, um bei den nächsten Präsidentschaftswahlen zu kandidieren, weil das darf man erst mit 35, die gehört zu den jungen Politikerinnen in den USA, die äh, auf die Modern Monetary Theory von Mitchell und Fazi hören und die beginnen sozusagen politische Konzepte zu entwickeln, die dieser ökonomischen Theorie entsprechen. Das ist zum ersten Mal seit langer Zeit, dass die Linke ein, eine wirkliche ökonomische Theorie verfolgt, die sich unterscheidet von dem, was im Moment so Mainstream ist. Und wenn Sie sich erinnern, sozusagen die große neokonservative, neoliberale äh, Revolution hat ja auch damit angefangen, dass die neoliberalen Politiker wie Reagan und Thatcher eine ökonomische Theorie äh, herangezogen haben als Paradigma. Das war damals die äh, Theorie der sogenannten Chicago Boys rund um Milton Friedman, die eben gesagt hat, der Staat soll sich zurückziehen, Sparprogramme fahren und so weiter. Die Auswirkungen kennen Sie alle heute. Äh, das war damals vielleicht sogar eher eine Ideologie, die bereits bestehende politische Absichten gerechtfertigt hat. Hier ist das anders, das ist eine wirkliche Theorie, die in der Lage ist, ein ganz neues Nachdenken über ökonomische Zusammenhänge zu eröffnen und die vielleicht auch in der Lage ist, eine Theorie dessen zu sein, wie man sowas wie einen Green New Deal herstellen kann. Also äh, eine ökonomische Grundlage zu schaffen dafür, dass die westlichen Gesellschaften es fertig bringen, mit den ökologischen Ressourcen in irgendeiner Weise so umzugehen, dass auch Kinder und Enkelkinder von uns äh, noch hier auf dem Planeten leben können. Also wie schafft man die ökonomischen und politischen Verhältnisse, damit das möglich und finanzierbar ist? Das ist eine der Kernabsichten der Modern Monetary Theory, die jetzt von den jungen demokratischen Politikerinnen und Politikern äh, aufgesogen und äh, mitkonzipiert wird. Dazu wird Thomas Fazi Ihnen heute noch mehr sagen. Ganz kurz vielleicht zu den allgemeinen Hintergründen, warum ich äh, mir gedacht habe, dass es sehr wichtig ist, über diese Fragen äh, der Souveränität nachzudenken. Sie haben vielleicht schon öfter das bemerkt, im Moment ist es doch in Österreich und nicht nur in Österreich so, wenn jemand auch nur schüchtern die Frage stellt, kann der Staat nicht vielleicht doch manches besser als die EU oder wäre es nicht besser, wenn wir manches auf der staatlichen Ebene entscheiden würden und nicht auf der EU-Ebene. Denken Sie nur an die Bologna-Reform zum Beispiel, ob das wirklich so eine super Idee war, die da von den Brüsseler Bürokraten vorgeschlagen und von allen gehorsamst umgesetzt wurde. Immer wenn das passiert, dass jemand sagt, naja, vielleicht hätten wir das lieber doch auf staatlicher Ebene und mit eigener Souveränität entschieden und vielleicht hätten wir es dann besser entschieden, dann äh, sagen gutmeinende Leute, die sich selber zur Linken zählen, na du bist aber ein Nationalist, du willst zurück zu einer ethnisch homogenen Volksgemeinschaft und so weiter. Äh, 
Sie sagen dann auch gern dazu, na, für dich haben wir das Europa der Regionen. Ja, da können Sie dann sagen, Dankeschön, jetzt bin ich ein Müllviertler oder äh, sowas. Ne? Äh, also das ist, glaube ich, sozusagen eine, eine dominante neoliberale Ideologie, die, äh, wie das im Moment leider Teile der sogenannten Linken oft tun, alle Probleme sofort kulturalisiert. Ja? Also der Ruf nach dem Staat, das ist wahrscheinlich der Ruf nach irgendeiner nestwarmen Territorialgemeinschaft, wo sich alle irgendwie kennen, was anderes kann das gar nicht sein. Und das ist, glaube ich, ein entscheidender Irrtum, den, über den die Linke anfangen muss nachzudenken oder auch die fortschrittliche Mitte. Ich glaube, die Frage, über die sich nachzudenken lohnt, lautet, ob der Staat nicht bestimmte ökonomische und politische Aufgaben besser erfüllen kann als die EU, die das im Moment entweder nicht kann oder auch grundsätzlich nicht will. Und das ist unser Thema heute. <lacht> Wenn Sie denken, wie das in Österreich war vor einem Jahr bei den letzten Nationalratswahlen, da kann man ja ohne große Probleme und ohne große Übertreibungen feststellen, es ist der Rechten und der extremen Rechten in Österreich gelungen, eine Themenführerschaft zu übernehmen. Das Problem der Flüchtlinge hat die Wahlen total dominiert, obwohl das weder von der Zahl noch von der ökonomischen Größenordnung her ein so relevantes Problem wäre. Aber dieses Problem war das Zentrum dieser Wahl und damit wurde diese Wahl gewonnen. Die Linke oder die Mitte war in dieser Frage ohne jede Antwort. Es war vollkommen klar, dass Menschen in Österreich große Angst haben, nicht nur vor Flüchtlingen, sondern vor Zuwanderung insgesamt. Und es war auch klar, dass diese Menschen keineswegs nur alle Rassisten oder Islamophobiker sind, sondern es ist ganz klar, dass die Zuwanderung in den westlichen Gesellschaften im Moment Lohndruck im Niedriglohnbereich erzeugt. Das ist aber nur unter ganz bestimmten Umständen ein Problem, denn äh, das ist dann ein Problem, wenn der Großteil der Gesellschaft keine Zukunftschancen mehr für sich sieht. Wenn die Leute das Gefühl haben, also ob ich morgen noch einen besseren Job kriege als heute oder ob ich überhaupt noch denselben habe morgen wie heute und ob meine Kinder überhaupt noch einmal so einen Job haben wie ich, das ist eher fraglich, dann ist Zuwanderung ein Problem. Die Älteren von Ihnen werden sich vielleicht erinnern, in den 1970er Jahren hatten wir eine massive Zuwanderung, die viel größer war, weil der Arbeitsmarkt in Österreich Arbeitskräfte gebraucht hat und damals war Zuwanderung überhaupt kein Problem oder ein sehr geringes. Es war völlig klar, dass wir Arbeitskräfte brauchen und wir lebten damals unter einer Politik, in der die Parole war Chancengleichheit, in der der Staat massiv investiert hat und in der Leute plötzlich studieren konnten, die vielleicht zehn Jahre vorher noch nicht hätten studieren können und die auch heute vielleicht nicht mehr studieren können. Das war alles anders und damals hatten die Leute darum das Gefühl, ich werde morgen einen besseren Job haben als heute und wenn nicht ich, dann werden meine Kinder einen besseren Job haben als ich heute. Und dann war das kein Problem, wenn Leute gekommen sind, die den schlechteren Job von gestern haben wollten. Das ist nur dann ein Problem, wenn man das Gefühl hat, ich werde morgen einen schlechteren Job haben. Dann hat man natürlich Stress, wenn man sich denkt, da kommt jetzt wer, der will den schlechteren Job aber auch haben. Dann sind Flüchtlinge oder Zuwanderer ein großes Problem. Ich glaube, wenn man das nicht in den Blick nimmt, dann äh, starrt man wie das Kaninchen auf die Schlange auf das Problem der Zuwanderung. Wenn man aber auf die Ursachen schaut, wann ist Zuwanderung willkommen, wann ist sie ein Problem und wann ist sie kein Problem, dann hat man vielleicht sehr viel bessere Antworten als die Rechte, die ja nur das Symptom im Auge hat, aber nicht die Ursachen. Wir müssen also darüber nachdenken, wie kann man eigentlich Bedingungen herstellen, unter denen die Leute wieder Zukunftsperspektiven haben, wo sie das Gefühl haben, es geht weiter im Land, ich werde morgen einen besseren Job haben oder ich kann mit Sicherheit zumindest erwarten, dass ich denselben behalte. Wir werden keine Abstiegsgesellschaft, wie das das Buch des Soziologen Nachtweih bezeichnet hat, Abstiegsgesellschaft, weil viele Menschen das eben fürchten, dass es mit ihnen oder ihren Kindern sozial abwärts gehen wird. Wir sind das nicht, sondern der Staat investiert, schafft Arbeit, und Beschäftigung und Wohlstand und äh, dann äh, habe ich keine Angst nach hinten, sondern freue mich nach vorne, was aus mir noch alles werden kann und blick nicht ängstlich, wer dahinter mir nachfolgt. Das heißt, wenn man 
von dem Problem und der Themenführerschaft der Rechten in Bezug auf Flüchtlinge und Zuwanderung irgendwie wegkommen will, dann muss man das Problem der Ursachen stellen. Und das heißt, wie schaffen wir wieder einen Wohlfahrtsstaat, der den Menschen Chancengleichheit gibt, der für zunehmende Gleichheit in der Gesellschaft sorgt und nicht wie im Moment die Politik in der ÖU für zunehmende soziale Ungleichheit. Und das führt uns eben zu der Frage des heutigen Abends. Kann die EU überhaupt so etwas herstellen? Ist die EU in der Lage, eine ökonomische Politik zu verfolgen, die in den einzelnen EU-Mitgliedstaaten so etwas wie wachsende soziale Gleichheit erzeugt? Oder kann die EU das vielleicht grundsätzlich nicht und kann das vielleicht nur der Nationalstaat? Das ist die These, die Thomas Fazi und William Mitchell in ihrem Buch vertreten. Man muss mit der Antwort übrigens nicht unbedingt übereinstimmen. Ich glaube, worin wir aber sicherlich übereinstimmen werden heute Abend ist, dass man diese Frage stellen muss. Die Linke und die fortschrittliche Mitte müssen dieser Frage ins Auge sehen, was der Staat unter Umständen besser kann oder wie man einen Wohlfahrtsstaat wiederherstellen kann. Wenn man das nicht macht, wenn man diese Frage unter den Teppich kehrt, dann wird die ganze Frage des Staates zu einer Beute der populistischen Rechten. Und die kulturalisiert die Frage dann wieder. Dann ist es wieder eine Frage unserer nationalen Identität, unserer kulturellen Homogenität, unseres Erbes. Und wir Österreicher fallen uns dann sicher sofort alle solidarisch um den Hals, wenn die Ausländer endlich weg sind, weil Interessenskonflikte haben wir ja nie gehabt hier. Ne? <lacht> Ja, vielleicht noch ein Beispiel. Zufällig ist mir heute ein Artikel über Portugal wieder mal in die Hände gefallen. Sie kennen vielleicht diesen Fall. Das muss einem doch zu denken geben. Portugal hat seit vier Jahren eine sozialdemokratische Minderheitsregierung, die auf die Empfehlungen der Europäischen Zentralbank und den relativ sanften oder heftigen Druck der EU, Austeritätsprogramme äh, zu fahren, nicht nachgegeben haben. Diese Regierung hat Schulden gemacht, hat für Beschäftigung gesorgt, hat dadurch äh, die Arbeitslosigkeit dramatisch gesenkt, die ist von rund 20 Prozent auf rund 6 Prozent zurückgegangen, die ist inzwischen niedriger als die österreichische. Äh, sie hat ein relativ beträchtliches Wirtschaftswachstum zustande gebracht und wie in dem Artikel gestanden ist, interessanterweise hat der Rechtspopulismus in Portugal nicht die geringste Chance. Das sind doch Zustände, von denen man irgendwie lernen könnte und da sieht man auch, was man tun muss, damit der Rechtspopulismus keine Chance hat. Ich glaube also, und das muss man vielleicht so als generelle Perspektive ins Auge fassen. Man muss wegkommen von einer Frontstellung, in der wir auf der einen Seite finstere Rechtspopulisten haben und auf der anderen Seite kulturalistische Kosmopoliten, die jede Kritik als nationalistisch und ähnlich abtun. Ich glaube, wenn wir heute nicht bereit sind, auch die elitären Kosmopoliten, die dem Neoliberalismus äh, Dienst leisten, wenn wir die nicht gleichzeitig angreifen wie die Rechtspopulisten, dann werden wir die Rechtspopulisten stärken. Man muss heute leider zwei Kräfte angreifen, um mindestens eine schlagen zu können. Soweit vielleicht der grobe Umriss äh, dieses Problemfeldes, in dem wir uns heute bewegen. Äh, Thomas Fazi, mein Gast heute Abend, ist Journalist, Schriftsteller, hat eben gemeinsam mit dem Ökonomen Thomas äh, William Mitchell das wunderbare Buch Reclaiming the State geschrieben. Wenn Sie Thomas Fazi googeln, werden Sie eine ganze Reihe von sehr interessanten Artikeln finden, auch in deutscher Sprache, die er zu verschiedenen Problemen der gegenwärtigen Politik geschrieben hat. Und Thomas Fazi wird uns heute eben über diese Frage, was der Staat kann und warum es vielleicht notwendig sein wird, die Souveränität über den Nationalstaat zurückzugewinnen, über diese Frage wird er uns heute vortragen. Thomas, thank you very much for coming. The floor is yours. Is it on? Yes. Well, thank you very much, Robert. Uh, didn't understand everything you said, but uh, got bits and pieces. And um, thank you to the Open Society for the invitation, uh, for having me here to uh, talk about this troubled um, continent of ours. Now, Europe, or better, the European Union, 
is, as we all know, in a deep uh, crisis. It's still facing, uh, more than 10 years after the financial crisis, an economic crisis with many countries of the Union, uh, Greece, Italy, and others, uh, which are still stuck in a longer and deeper depression than that of the Great Depression of the 1930s, despite a timid recovery in recent years. We're also witnessing a growing divergence between the so-called countries of the core the center of Europe, the, more, the dominant countries, and the so-called countries of the European periphery. Um, Europe, of course, is also facing a social crisis with uh, millions of people uh, across the continent uh, unemployed, underemployed, and in poverty in greater numbers than we've seen in decades in some countries. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people in Italy, Greece, Spain, Portugal, uh, especially young people, uh, have been forced in recent years to uh, leave their country to search for employment elsewhere. So we have an entire generation that's been eradicated from its home, its families, and its friends. And then, of course, Europe is facing a political crisis with uh, tensions between countries and also between national populations uh, now arguably at the highest level in decades, uh, suffice to think of the strong anti-German feelings in many countries of Southern Europe, uh, or the increasingly explicit disdain for the Southern populations and Southern politicians and for the electoral outcomes in these countries, expressed by German politicians and commentators in recent years, uh, just to give an example. And as you know all too well here in Austria, uh, right-wing and allegedly nationalist parties and movements are growing in strength, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe, but also increasingly in Europe's uh, core countries. Uh, and where centrist, uh, where sort of establishment parties still do hold power, they are increasingly delegitimized and in some cases rocked by violent uh, so-called populist uprisings, uh, France being the most obvious example, of course. Um, not to mention, of course, the rupture between Britain and continental Europe caused by Brexit. And finally, we see a growing anti-EU and especially anti-Euro sentiment in a number of countries, especially those of the periphery, uh, including my country, Italy. Um, more in general, there's a growing estrangement between voters and political elites, with an increasing number of people feeling that their voices are not being heard by the political establishment and that their ability to have a say, to influence politics through the ballot box, through elections, uh, through our long-established democratic systems is being denied to them. Uh, in this sense, European states and national political systems are also facing a deep crisis of democracy and of legitimacy. Now, the standard explanation for this situation, which is, might be shared by some people in the room, uh, is the one I outlined in the One Europe Manifesto. And that is that as far as the continent's uh, economic and social problems are concerned, these are largely to be blamed on the incapacity of national states to deliver socially positive outcomes in an increasingly globalized world in which the power of global markets uh, has allegedly rendered individual states increasingly incapable of um, pursuing social and economic policies, especially of the redistributive progressive kind. Sometimes the responsibility for the EU and for the Euro in this situation is acknowledged, but this is usually put down to the incomplete nature of the European Union. That is to the fact that we don't have enough economic integration and that therefore we need to deepen it. Um, while as far as the political problems, the political fragmentation of Europe is concerned, this is often claimed to be the result um, of nationalism national self-interest, national rivalry, and on the arrogance of national governments, as is also said in the manifesto. Now, according to this narrative, the solution is to, uh, you know, fulfill the European promise, as we heard. This means to deeply democratize and reform the European Union in order to create a uh, fully-fledged, a full supranational democracy, a supranational state by all intents and purposes, uh, capable of creating, as the manifesto reads, a space of social security, solidarity, and justice across Europe, which is considered to be the European dream of the, of the forefathers of the EU, which it is, claims, well, it is claimed was subsequently betrayed by selfish national politicians, uh, leading to the situation in which we are today. Now, according to this view, the problems created by the EU, and particularly the monetary union, to the extent that they are acknowledged, are not considered to be structural problems 
of these entities. They're not considered to be intrinsic to their nature, but they are seen as, as a result, at best, of their imperfect nature, which doesn't allow them to fulfill the aim which they are said to have been designed for, and which are allegedly enshrined in the European treaties. That aim being, namely, that of creating a new European body politic based on the social market economy, full employment, and the protection of services in the general public interest, uh, as the manifesto states. Now, um, as much as I respect this view, I would like to offer an alternative explanation for the current crisis. Um, I would argue that the problems that we're facing in Europe today, uh, its economic, social, and political crisis, as well as its democratic crisis, are a direct result of the European architecture. And even more importantly, that as far as its economic and social effects uh, and the impact on democracy are concerned, they are the intended result of the European treaties and particularly of the post-Maastricht architecture. Uh, and that this is what is fueling the political fragmentation of Europe. Now, as far as the economic and social crisis is concerned, the mass unemployment that we see in a number of countries, particularly in the periphery, and more importantly, this divergence between the countries of the core, which register modest growth rates and relatively low uh, unemployment levels, if we think of Germany, for example. Um, so Germany and countries of the so-called German bloc, countries that are part of the German uh, sort of value chain, economic system, uh, they've done you know, relatively okay in recent years. But we also have other countries, particularly those of the periphery, which continue to be mired in stagnation and have very high unemployment levels. Uh, and moreover, we've seen the countries of the German bloc, which have registered very high export surpluses in recent, in, you know, in a, in a, uh, following the creation of the euro, while the countries of the periphery have registered uh, just as high trade deficits. Um, and so as far as the situation is concerned, um, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that this is a direct consequence of the Maastricht architecture, and specifically of the monetary union of the euro. It's a known law of economics that when countries that have different trading strengths, um, different economic structures and so on, fix their exchange rate, or even worse, enter into a monetary union, uh, that is, they give up control of their monetary policy and of their exchange rate policy, well, it's, uh, it's well known that the larger, more export-oriented economies, um, uh, which historically tend to be characterized by stronger currencies, uh, tend to benefit to the expense of the weaker, uh, less export-oriented economies. Uh, and this is especially true in the absence of forms of fiscal transfers between countries, uh, as is the case in the Eurozone, which can make up for these uh, differences in economic performance. Indeed, several economists of various orientations had warned in the years leading up to the Euro that the Euro would not lead to economic convergence and that the euro would not strengthen the political bonds between European nations, which was the officially stated aim of monetary union, but would, on the contrary, lead to a dramatic, dramatic divergence between countries. Uh, Paul Krugman, who may be the most famous American economist, wrote in the early 1990s um, that once a single currency, once a single currency uh, had been established, Europe would experience a dramatic concentration of production and employment in the countries, in the countries with more competitive and, more, and better developed economies of scale, such as Germany, at the expense of their European partners. As a result, Krugman wrote, uh, whole areas of the continent would be sentenced to productive desertification and worker outflow. Um, the German economist, uh, Rudiger uh, Dornbusch, uh, also pointed out in the 1990s that in abandoning exchange rate adjustments, uh, the euro would transfer to the labor market the task of adjusting for competitiveness, uh, meaning that losses in output and employment would be the result. Uh, and of course, and a similar point was also raised by none other than uh, Milton Friedman, who's uh, probably the most famous uh, neoliberal economist, uh, uh, who further added that imposing a common monetary policy while also depriving countries of flexible exchange rates uh, would force painful wage and price adjustments that, and I quote uh, Friedman, would exacerbate political tensions by converting divergent shocks that could have been easily accommodated by exchange rate changes into divisive political issues. 
In other words, uh, I've just quoted a few, but it was widely predictable, and in fact was predicted, that the euro would lead to mass unemployment and therefore to economic and political crises. And this, of course, is exactly what's happened. It's widely acknowledged today that Germany has benefited from the euro, uh, particularly in terms of its ability to boost its exports and to maintain a massive trade surplus, largely as a result of an artificially low exchange rate, and that this has led Germany to become increasingly powerful in economic and, power and political terms, while other countries have lost out, uh, particularly those of the periphery, uh, leading some commentators to talk of the rise of a new German empire. Um, there was a controversial the Spiegel uh, editorial from a few years back that even went as far as arguing that it wouldn't be out of place to talk of the rise of a fourth Reich. And uh, that, made, that was actually the title, I think, of the Der Spiegel uh, uh, edition. And this is what the article wrote. It said, that may sound absurd, the article reads, given that today's Germany is a successful democracy without a trace of national socialism, and that no one would actually associate Merkel with Nazism, of course. But, it goes on to say, further reflection on the word Reich, or empire, may not be entirely out of place. The term refers to a, domin a dominion with a central power exerting control over many different peoples. According to this definition, Der Spiegel asked, would it be wrong to speak of a German Reich in the economic realm? Uh, to be clear, this is not me speaking, this is uh, Der Spiegel. Um, so whether you agree with this analysis or not, we need to be clear about the fact that the, dom the evidently dominant role of some countries is not about these countries being more virtuous than others, it's not about some countries having done their homework while others have allegedly uh, spent all their money on women and alcohol, as uh, uh, Diesel Blaum, the former president of the Eurogroup, famously said of Italy a few years back. Now, this is uh, uh, largely, if not uniquely, due to the fact, as Fritz Schaff, who's the former director of the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Germany, uh, writes, and I quote, it's due to the fact that the present Euro regime is fundamentally asymmetric. It fits the structural preconditions and economic interests of northern economies, while it conflicts with the structural conditions of southern political economies, which it condemns to long periods of economic decline, stagnation, or low growth. In other words, the euro works for some economies and it doesn't work for others. So it might work for Austria, for example, that's up to you to decide, but it doesn't mean that it works for Italy or Greece or other countries. In this sense, it's important that we grasp the structural nature of Europe's economic and social crisis. Uh, and that is to say that this outcome was uh, not um, uh, collateral damage. This was the only possible outcome given the nature of the European Monetary Union and of monetary unions in general, for that matter. And so given the easily predictable and in fact predicted negative effects that the euro was bound to have on some countries, one may ask why political elites in these countries agreed to join the euro in the first place, in countries such as mine, for example. And this brings me to the next point in my argument, and that is that these outcomes were not the unintended effect of the euro, but were its desired effect. And what I mean is that national political elites across Europe, uh, but particularly in the more politically unstable countries of Europe, uh, such as Italy, embraced the external constraint, so to speak, of the euro as a way of depoliticizing economic policy. That is, of removing macroeconomic policies from democratic and parliamentary control, which is, of course, what happens when you transfer your monetary policy to a supranational institution completely insulated from... Uh, democratic politics. As the great late British economist Wing Godley uh, wrote in 1992 when the UK was debating whether to enter uh, the euro or not, uh, and I quote, he said the power to issue its own money, to make drafts on its own central bank, is the main thing which defines national independence. A country that loses or renounces that power effectively acquires the status of a local authority or colony. Uh, and again, I think it's impossible to fully grasp why national elites decided to deprive themselves of such a crucial power without taking into account depoliticization. And so their aim was not just to insulate economic policies from popular democratic challenges from below, but also to reduce the costs of the neoliberal uh, transition by placing the responsibility for unpopular measures onto external institutions. Uh, Guido Carli, who was Italy's um, highly influential treasury minister from 1989 to 1992, and who signed the Maastricht Treaty for Italy, 
uh, noted uh, that the European Union represented an alternative path for the solution of problems which we were not managing to handle through the normal channels of government and parliament. In this sense, we could say that European elites of uh, periphery countries accepted a subordinate uh, role within the German-dominated system in exchange for more favorable class relations in their uh, respective countries because they could deflect all demands coming from organized labor, for example, onto the practices and institutions of the euro, over which, of course, they have little control. Um, as Andrew Moravczyk uh, put it, and I quote, binding EU commitments enable governments to implement unpopular reforms at home while engaging in blame shift towards the EU. Um, even if they themselves, and this is the important point, had desired such policies in the first place. So I think in general terms it would be a mistake, as some people, even on the left, uh, do, to view the European integration process as one of supranational powers encroaching on the autonomy of nation states and of national elites. Rather, European integration, I would say, has been the tool through which national elites have managed to bypass democracy and to achieve political outcomes that they would have had a much harder time achieving if they had been held politically responsible and accountable for those decisions. In this sense, we could say that the EU accomplished a long-time neoliberal dream, that of constitutionalizing a liberal or neoliberal, uh, I would say, framework based around the famous four freedoms of the EU, the free, free movement of goods, of capital, of services, and of people. Uh, and of constitutionalizing this at the supranational level, where it would prove resistant to any democratic challenge by the people. And at this point, it should be noted that the European treaties haven't just deprived nation states, haven't just taken uh, away from nation states uh, control over monetary policy and exchange rate policy, effectively pre pre preventing traditional Keynesian demand management policies, but they extend into all areas of economic policy by effectively elevating competitiveness, the principle of competitiveness, above all other social and economic objectives. In this sense, I would uh, strongly disagree with the notion that the aim of the European treaties is that of upholding uh, full employment and the protection of services. Um, on the contrary, not only is the system structurally incompatible with the attainment of full employment in most countries, um, but um, by virtue of its rules on, for example, uh, nationalization, state aid, public procurement, and so on, they've opened up many sectors of the European economy to privatization and liberalization. And they have eroded state and municipal support to industry um, by de effectively deeming them in, in, in breach of competition law. And there's many examples of this. And furthermore, they've also made it increasingly difficult to regulate labor markets in favor of workers, as the various pro-business rulings of the European Court of Justice uh, show very clearly. And it should be noted that the economic constitution created by the European treaties is a very peculiar constitutional order, not only because it didn't emerge as a result of a democratic process, but because due to its supranational nature, Unlike national constitutions, it cannot be democratically amended. It cannot be democratically reformed by citizens. It can only be amended unanimously in the context of a new international agreement between all European member states, which in practical terms, and I'll get to this later, means that it is not reformable. Um, and on this point, I'd also like to add that this was always the aim of supranationalism, of supranational ideology, which, not surprisingly, is a political theory uh, largely developed uh, or perfected in the early 20th century by neoliberal thinkers, such as Hayek and von Mises, precisely to deal with what they saw as an excess of democracy engendered by national democracies, where workers and organized labor had been integrated into the political system through mass parties. In their view, this excess of democracy had to be contained and restrained by locking countries into an international, but even better, supranational legal arrangement that would undermine the possibility of government intervention in the economy and popular uh, uh, redistribution. Um, so supranationalism, until relatively recently, was the ideology of the elites, was the ideology of the capitalists. 
is the ideology of global institutions such as the World Trade Organization, uh, the IMF, and so on. So it's a rather peculiar twist of history, I would say, that large sections of the European left today have turned to supranationalism, have embraced supranationalism, especially if we consider that this is the opposite of leftist internationalism, which by definition, as the term implies, means the collaboration between nations and between peoples who are democratically organized at the national level. That's the opposite of supranationalism. In this sense, I'm always surprised when I hear people talk of you know, democratic supranationalism, because supranational, supranationalism was born with the precise intent of disempowering democracy. Indeed, from this perspective, I think it's perfectly understandable that a growing number of people across the continent view the European Union and especially the Euro uh, architecture as a machine that is hindering the democratic rights and aspirations of voters. Uh, how else should Italians react to an unelected European Commission telling them that their government is not allowed to run the budget deficit needed to implement the measures they voted for? Um, or what are the Greeks supposed to think uh, of the ECB's machinations to force the country into accepting a new wave of austerity measures by effectively shutting down the country's banking system, which is what it did in 2015, despite voters expressing en masse, both in the national elections and in the referendum that was held in 2015, uh, expressing a desire to repeal those austerity policies. So I think it's quite clear that the European Union has become a tool for uh, hindering the democratic aspirations of the European people, not for promoting those aspirations. And this is not due to its imperfect construction, I would say, but by the very nature of its design. So we have come to a point where monetary union, uh, the Eurozone especially, has become not only, I think, economically and socially unstable, unsustainable, but also increasingly politically unsustainable. And so we're reminded again of Wing Godley's words, which I read uh, shortly um, uh, just now. As he wrote, a country that loses or renounces the power to issue its own money effectively acquires the status of a local authority or colony. And this is quite uh, visible in a number of countries today. The episodes I just mentioned uh, uh, are really a demonstration of the kind of Faustian pact that national elites have signed by entering the Eurozone. By giving up their country's economic sovereignty, they have effectively made their political survival uh, dependent on the goodwill of unelected uh, technocrats and Eurocrats and the European Commission and the ECB. We may call this the revenge of depoliticization, in the sense that if the strategy of depoliticization worked for a while, so long as the Euro regime was able to guarantee a modicum, a bit of growth and a bit of a... Uh, employment growth to the countries of the periphery, but now that the fundamental contradictions of the European system have come to the fore, political elites in countries uh, such as Italy, such as Greece, uh, even Spain, if we look at what happened in Spain was a recent um, budget proposed by the, Sp the Spanish government, find themselves lacking the economic tools necessary not just to improve the material conditions of the people, but to make, but on a much more fun basic level, to maintain societal consensus. Um, um, and look, we shouldn't really, we shouldn't underestimate the danger of frustrating democratic politics, of impeding the normal functioning of democracy, which is what the euro is doing in a number of countries, because history teaches us that this is how monsters are born. And I think uh, we're seeing that already in a number of countries, um, including mine. And so the question is, you know, what to do now, of course. Uh, uh, now, one could argue that the sensible thing to do, and most people on the left in Europe still seem to agree, would be to transform, as the manifesto states, the European Union, and particularly the Eurozone, into a workable, sustainable system. Uh, this would require a radical reform of the European treaties in a more solidaristic and Keynesian uh, direction. So you would need a kind of Eurozone government, which uh, would capable of running budget deficits with the support of the ECB, you would need full debt mutualization. You would need permanent fiscal transfers between countries from the richer countries and regions to the poorer countries and regions and so on. Essentially, you would need what every uh, federation or state in the world has in order for it to, to work. But if we're in the business of politics, then we have to ask ourselves, uh, is that feasible? Is that a feasible objective? Let's take a minute to think what such sweeping institutional reform 
at the European level would require? Uh, in, first of all, it would require progressive governments, uh, governments that share this view of a reformed Europe, coming to power in pretty much every single country of the Union, at the, more or less at the same time. Because we've seen what happens when one country tries to uh, go at it alone. Uh, and after all, the only way to modify the treaties is through unanimity in the European Council. Uh, so it's enough for one country to say, I don't agree with these reforms, to stop, uh, to stop the process of reform. Now, one doesn't have to be particularly pessimistic to see why getting almost 30 countries to agree uh, more or less at the same time on a proposal for European, for European reform is, uh, is quite unlikely and, in my opinion, uh, impossible. But on a more fundamental level, I think, the, the unreformability of the European Union, at least in a more democratic, progressive direction, has to do with the very nature of democracy itself. As the term suggests and as history shows, democracy presupposes the existence of an underlying demos, a political community, uh, usually, though not always, defined by a shared and relatively homogenous uh, language, culture, history, normative system, etc. Uh, this is what history shows, uh, in which the majority of the members of society feel sufficiently connected to each other to voluntarily commit to a democratic discourse and to a related decision-making process, and therefore to accept the legitimacy of government and of majority rule, importantly. Even more importantly, in modern states and federations which have highly developed welfare states, this identification is crucial in creating those effective ties, those bonds of solidarity that are needed to legitimize and sustain redistributive policies between classes and also between regions within a country. And so simply put, if there is no demos, there can be no democracy, let alone a social democracy. And I think it's no coincidence that, the, that democracy evolved within the confines of the nation state, since historically this has been the only political entity capable of giving rise to communities sufficiently large in demographic and territorial terms to guarantee their reproduction, but also sufficiently homo homogenous to guarantee democratic legitimacy, uh, which is, of course, a fundamental element of uh, democracy. As the Greek economist Kostas Lapavitsas writes, the absence of a European demos with integral class divisions prevents the existence of normal politics in the EU. There are no social cleavages applying uniformly across EU member states that could be organically reflected in political contestation within EU institutions. No class or other social divisions in Europe take a homogenous European form, for there are no occupational, organizational, habitual, cultural, and historical norms able to create this uh, European social integration. Actual class divisions in Europe always take a national form, as do the party politics that correspond to these divisions. As Lapavistas writes, in Marxist terms, there's neither a European capitalist class nor is there a European working class. And so the European Union doesn't just um, prevent uh, you know, democracy, but also class conflict, uh, which is something that you know, the left should uh, um, be interested in. And so in this sense, a European supranational democracy at the most fundamental level is impossible because there is no European demos at the moment. And this is not to say that such a demos uh, will not emerge in the future, but it cannot be created by diktat, it cannot be created by stealth, it needs time for it to emerge, uh, and I would say quite a long time uh, in the European context. And so the notion that in the near future, a European state could emerge with sufficient power and legitimacy, importantly, to replicate the practices of normal states is, uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, very, very unlikely. Um, in this sense, the EU's democratic deficit is also not the result of its faulty or incomplete nature. It's the only possible kind of democracy that you can have at the supranational level in Europe, um, given the current situation. And I think it's precisely this encroachment on the democratic and social rights of Europeans by the European Union, often facilitated by national elites, as I said, that I think is at the root of the, of the current political fragmentation in Europe. I would also add, uh, add that I think it's, uh, it's partly at the root also of the xenophobic and uh, racist backlash that we're witnessing in many countries. 
Most obviously because I think it would be na naive to expect countries such as Italy, where millions of people are unemployed, to show solidarity towards immigrants. As much as that would be desirable, we know from history that this is just not how societies work. As Lord Beveridge, who is one of, you know, one of the founders of the British welfare state, wrote in the 1940s, so long as chronic mass unemployment seems possible, each man appears as the enemy of his fellow man in a scramble for jobs. So long as there is a scramble for jobs, uh, no, by the scramble for jobs, many uh, still uglier growths are fostered, hatred of foreigners and so on. The failure to use our productive powers is the source of an interminable succession of evils. When that failure has been overcome, the way will be open to progress in unity without fear. So what Beveridge was saying effectively, you know, in, in, in our context is, th is that on a fundamental level, the solution to xenophobia consists in, first of all, in improving the material conditions of the local populations, which the Euro architecture prevents many countries from doing. Um, but I also think the resistance to immigration in this historical phase is also the result of the widespread feeling of not having control over these policies. Uh, this, I can speak for Italy, this is certainly the case in Italy. Um, simply put, people tend to rebel against policies that they feel are being imposed on them from above, especially on such sensitive issues. In this sense, I think it's an illusion for the left to appeal to European redistribution quotas and so on to solve the problem. Um, ultimately, the question of building democratic consensus at the national level for immigration policies, for example, cannot be sidestepped. Uh, and this is what progressives, I think, should focus on. I think the left is uh, deluding itself if it thinks that it can appeal to Europe to solve these problems at the national level. Also, I wouldn't frame the current predicament as one which pits nationalists against Europeanists. Um, Nationalism has quite a specific meaning in European history. It's understood as meaning a nation and a people that considers itself superior to other countries and other peoples and thus therefore thinks that it has the right to oppress other nations. Um, this is certainly what you know, 20th century nationalism in Europe has largely been about. Now, honestly, I don't see that this definition, uh, this definition applies to uh, many countries in Europe today, if any, except maybe Germany. But that's, but, but, <laughs> And by the same token, also the term Europeanism uh, doesn't mean much to me. I mean, I think, of course, we're all pro-European to the extent that we love European culture, we love traveling across Europe, we love sharing its diversity. Um, so, you know, I consider myself a pro-European by, uh, by all intents and purposes. Um, no, I think the struggle that we're, that we're seeing, if anything, if anything, is between those countries that are asserting the, to a certain extent, legitimate national interests and even to a certain extent, the democratic will of the people, whether we like uh, those demands that come from the people or not, uh, they're exerting these uh, rights in opposition to the EU, um, as some countries are doing, the countries of, you know, to a certain extent, the countries of Eastern Europe, for example, and other countries. Um, and, and those countries instead, such as Germany and France, who are asserting their national interests through the institutions of the EU. But I think it's the same logic at play. Uh, it's not very different in my opinion. And so I think the struggle would better be defined as one between, uh, I think a better term would be sovereignism, which is different from nationalism and essentially consists in asserting the sovereign rights of a country, which is not in contradiction with internationalism at all. On one side, so sovereignism on one hand and supranationalism on the other, which I, I think, as I said, consists in sidestepping in bypassing those rights. Now, if this is the battle, and I think it is, and I think it will increasingly be the battle in the future, um, for the left to side with supranationalism, I think would be um, a strategic mistake. And that is because, as I said, the supranational level, for its very nature, cannot be democratized and cannot be made, uh, in my opinion, to work in the interests of the people. The national level, on the other side, is a playing field which can and should be democratized, and where the democratic demands of the people can be expressed in a variety of ways. They can be expressed in re regressive, reactionary ways, as is the case across most of Europe today. 
uh, largely due to the fact, I would add, that the left has abandoned the national terrain to the right. Or it can be, all these demands can be expressed in a progressive, uh, emancipatory way. But that, I think, is the level at which the democratic battle should be fought, the national level. In this sense, I think the, the left, and this is what we argue in the book, should develop a progressive vision of national sovereignty and of, uh, and of new forms of international collaboration. Uh, one where, just like in the past, uh, the institutions of the democratic nation state are used to translate the demands for greater democracy and greater control over the economy and greater protection by the state that electorates everywhere seem to be asking, they can transform and translate the, the, these demands in a progressive platform, in opposition to the reactionary platform of uh, right-wing parties. And there's no reason to think that this should come at the expense of European collaboration. Uh, as mentioned, I think it's precisely the socially uh, um, nefarious and anti-democratic nature of the euro that is that by fueling national resentments, is also endangering European multilateral cooperation on the issues that really matter, climate change, uh, and of course also uh, immigration. You know, I mean, the, the, this animosity between countries is hindering any, uh, any form of uh, cooperation on the issue of how to handle these, um, these massive flows of people. On the contrary, I would argue that uh, abandoning the euro, uh, dismantling the euro, which is you know, what we argue for in the book, um, would not undermine that sort of cooperation. On the contrary, by allowing governments to maximize the well-being of their citizens, it could and should provide the basis for a renewed European project based on multilateral international cooperation between sovereign democratic states, which is very different from what we have at the moment. And I would also add that this would not be a step back towards some dark past, as is often implied, you know, this retreat to the nation state, but I, I would, I would, it would rather be an embrace of the new emerging international system Wherever we look, particularly in Asia, but also in other continents, um, this new system that is emerging at the international level is not characterized by the creation of complex, supranational institutions, but rather by much more lightweight, pragmatic arrangements between states focused not on the achievement of impossible uh, uh, of the impossible goal of regional or world governments, but rather on the achievement of practical, realistic goals in fields of trade, defense, research, the environment, and so on, while preserving the sovereign and, in most cases, uh, you know, in even the democratic rights of states. There are, uh, you know, we, we think of China when we think of Asia, but there are also a number of democratic states in, uh, in Asia. Um, and so I think this is the future where we're heading. The age of um, the age of globe of, of what has been called globalism, so the age of international and supranational institutions such as the IMF and the World Bank, and imperial states such as the U.S. imposing their will and their model across the entire globe, which is what supranationalism and globalism is all about. Uh, I think that that stage in, in, in history is is over, is coming to an end. We are heading towards an increasingly multipolar world, a multipolar order, where, contrary to what, uh, contrary to kind of the dominant narrative in Europe, uh, states will be more important than ever, and this, I would argue, is a good thing, uh, because as the economist um, Danny Roderick writes, historically the nation state has been closely associated with economic, social, and political progress. It curbed internal violence. It expanded networks of solidarity beyond local communities. It spurred mass markets and industrialization. It enabled the mobilization of human and financial resources, resources and fostered the spread of represent, representative political institutions. Why would we want to give that up? Um, and especially if we consider that many of these achievements uh, have been rolled back uh, precisely by the kind of supranational institutions, such as the European Union, that many people on the left today uh, defend. And uh, this is why, as Roger uh, also says, the state remains indispensable to the achievement of desirable economic and social outcomes, precisely because it offers protection from the forces of globalization. 
Countries can uphold national standards in labor markets, in finance, in taxation, and in other areas. And they can do so, if necessary, by raising barriers at the border when international trade and finance demonstrably threatens domestic practices that enjoy democratic support. So the state remains essential for the uh, practice of democracy, even, and I would say, especially in today's world. And so, uh, to conclude, I think um, the EU is a relic. It's not the future. I would argue that it's a relic of a globalist past that is already dying. And the future, uh, and, and especially the future of the left, on the other hand, uh, I would argue lies in the nation state and lies in new forms of international and even internationalist uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you very much, Thomas. It is not an easy task for me to sum up this very concise presentation which, uh, in which no sentence was too much. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, absolutely. It was perfectly logical and a, a masterpiece of demonstration, as I would, would argue. But um, if you allow, I will just briefly try to say a few things in German so that uh, everybody is on board with the rough lines of your argument. Um, Thomas Fazi hat eine Reihe von Problemen benannt, die er in der EU im Moment sieht. Die ökonomische Krise, dass es kaum Wachstum gibt, die Divergenz, das Auseinanderdriften zwischen dem Zentrum und der Peripherie innerhalb der EU, also zum Beispiel Deutschland und Österreich auf der einen Seite und den südlicheren Ländern wie Italien, Griechenland, Spanien, Portugal, die massive Arbeitslosigkeit, auch die politische Krise, die auftretenden Spannungen, einerseits die antideutschen Ressentiments der südlichen Länder, andererseits die Verachtung der nördlichen Länder für die südlichen Länder und so weiter. Und auch die zunehmende Entfremdung zwischen den Wählern oder auch Nichtwählern, wie wir sagen müssen, und den politischen Eliten. Während das Manifest von Johannes Foggenhuber, wie Fazi gesagt hat, das alle diese Probleme sieht, aber die Ursachen in einem noch unvollständig vollzogenen europäischen Integration vermutet. Also es gibt noch nicht genug äh, Integration in der EU, äh, der Integrationsprozess ist noch nicht genügend abgeschlossen oder der Nationalismus ist schon wieder zu sehr aufgetaucht äh, und man müsse also das europäische Versprechen in stärkerem Maß erfüllen. Äh, im Gegensatz zu dieser Auffassung sieht Thomas Fazi äh, die Probleme durch die EU selbst verursacht, durch ihre Strukturen. Und er sagt nicht nur, dass diese Ursachen strukturell an der EU hängen und innerhalb der EU nicht gelöst werden können, sondern äh, schlimmer noch, diese äh, Effekte sind auch genau die gewünschten Effekte der EU. Wir werden das vielleicht in der äh, Diskussion auch noch äh, behandeln können, warum gewünscht. Ich springe jetzt ein bisschen, um auf die Folgen zu kommen, auf die Schlussfolgerungen. Der entscheidende Punkt, den Fazi angesprochen hat, ist ein Wechsel in der ökonomischen Politik. Die Älteren unter Ihnen erinnern sich vielleicht noch das, was in den 70er Jahren in Österreich diese Blüte ermöglicht hat oder auch diese Fülle an Hoffnungen und auch viele Karrieren das war eine keynesianische Wirtschaftspolitik. John Maynard Keynes war dieser englische geniale Mathematiker, der unter dem Eindruck der Weltwirtschaftskrise eine ökonomische Strategie entworfen hat, die äh, dem Staat die Rolle zuspielt, in den Momenten der Krise zu investieren und dadurch Beschäftigung, Wohlstand, Wachstum und soziale Sicherheit zu schaffen. Das war das Muster, nachdem westliche kapitalistische Staaten nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg, übrigens egal wer sie regiert hat, ob die Linke oder die Rechte, nachdem diese Staaten funktioniert haben. Noch 1971 übrigens hat Richard Nixon beileibe kein Linker gesagt, we are all Keynesians. Ja, also so verbreitet und dominant war dieses Paradigma. Fazit sagt, wenn wir einen Sozialstaat wollen, wenn wir wollen, dass es zunehmende Gleichheit gibt, äh, demokratische Partizipation und so weiter, dann brauchen wir wieder einen Keynesianismus. 
Und das ist nicht möglich in, in der EU. Äh, das ist durch die Maastricht-Verträge ausgeschlossen. Deshalb sieht er diese äh, Perspektive nicht als eine äh, strukturelle Möglichkeit innerhalb der EU. Und er sagt auch, das war auch das erklärte Ziel der sogenannten Supranationalisten. Also das ist kein Betriebsunfall, sondern genau so wollten die äh, konservativen neoliberalen Ökonomen äh, Hayek und Mises das haben. Die haben auch gefürchtet, dass es schon einen Exzess an demokratischer Mitbestimmung gibt und dass man deshalb zu supranationalen Regelungen äh, übergehen muss, um diesen Überschuss an Demokratie in Europa einzudämmen. Und das äh, ist ja eigentlich auch das, was wir beobachten können. Auf die Frage, äh, was tun, sagt äh, Thomas Fazi, äh, man muss zurück äh, auf das Niveau des Nationalstaates. Nur dort ist es möglich, durch demokratische Entscheidungen so etwas wie eine keynesianische Politik wiederherzustellen, so wie das übrigens gerade in Portugal eben passiert ist. Was wir aber beobachten ist, dass in vielen Ländern die Institutionen der Europäischen Union genau solche demokratischen Entscheidungen verhindern, wenn zum Beispiel die Europäische Zentralbank 2015 plötzlich in Griechenland die, sozusagen die Bankomaten sperrt, wie Sie das vielleicht noch erinnern können, oder auch wenn die Europäische Zentralbank der italienischen Regierung das, wofür diese Regierung gewählt wurde, nämlich zu investieren und ein Programm, das über Schulden finanzierte Konjunkturprogramme operiert, durchzuführen, wenn die Europäische Zentralbank da diesen Willen der italienischen Regierung unterbindet. Dann wird die Europäische Union zu einem Verhinderer von demokratischer Politik und das führt auch klarerweise in der Folge dann zu fremden feindlichen Eruptionen, denn man kann davon ausgehen, dass Menschen, die Arbeitslosigkeit erleben oder sie befürchten, nicht gerade die größten Vertreter von Solidarität und Hilfsbereitschaft gegenüber Migranten sein können. Das darf man von Arbeitslosen nicht erwarten. Äh, Fazit, damit fasse ich einen letzten Punkt zusammen, ja, dieser Darstellung sagt, äh, wir müssen auch die Fragen neu formulieren. Die Frage die, um die es im Moment geht, ist nicht Nationalisten gegen Europäer. Äh, Nationalisten, das sind solche, die das Gefühl haben, ihre Nation ist allen anderen überlegen. Solche, sagt Fazi, gibt es heute kaum mehr in Europa, vielleicht mit Ausnahme der Deutschen. Äh, die entscheidende Frage ist, äh, sind wir Anhänger der Souveränität oder sind wir Anhänger, Anhänger der Supernationalität? Also sind wir Anhänger einer demokratischen Selbstbestimmung oder sind wir Anhänger äh, supranationaler Institutionen, die die demokratische Selbstbehinderung verhindern, Selbstbestimmung verhindern? Und das scheint die entscheidende Frage zu sein, wenn es um die Zukunftsaufgaben geht geht, die man in Europa lösen muss. Er sagt, eigentlich muss die Linke versuchen, das zu erreichen. Die Linke war nie supranationalistisch, sondern sie war immer internationalistisch. Und Internationalismus bedeutet, dass es Kollaborationen zwischen selbstbestimmten demokratischen Staaten gibt. Und nur auf dieser Ebene, vermutet Fazi, könnte man auch die großen Aufgaben, die sich der Politik in den nächsten Jahren stellen werden, nämlich zum Beispiel eben der Klimaveränderung entgegenzuwirken oder auch mit dem Problem der Migration umzugehen. Nur auf dieser Ebene könnte man das in Zukunft schaffen. Letzter Punkt. Fazi hat gesagt, erstens muss man dazu also die Währungsunion auflösen. Ein entscheidender Punkt demokratischer Selbstbestimmung ist Souveränität über die eigene Währung. Wenn ein Staat seine eigene Währung nicht mehr in der Hand hat, wird er zur Kolonie. Und dann äh, muss man versuchen, ein erneuertes europäisches Projekt ins Leben zu rufen, das ähnlich wie bestimmte Systeme in Asien derzeit funktionieren und das vormachen, eine leichtgewichtige Kooperation auf einer pragmatischen Ebene zwischen äh, Staaten herstellen, 
das Fazit letzter Satz war, die Supranationalität ist ein Modell, das am Absterben ist. Wir müssen eine neue Form finden einer internationalen Kooperation zwischen souveränen, demokratisch legitimierten Staaten. Soweit mein Versuch, Ihnen das in kurzen Sätzen zu umreißen. Um, Thank you, Thomas. I did my best. I hope I have not delivered a caricature of what you have been saying. Um, maybe I start with one uh, obvious objection that, uh, forgive me for repeating it, uh, you probably have been facing many times already. Uh, one of the things that people who advocate what you are saying, states should return to their own currency, the first objection that always comes is, oh, we are such a small state, especially in Austria, we always feel very small and innocent, and uh, <laughs> we are such a small state, and when we return to our, uh, our little shilling, then the international forces will come and speculate against our currency and that they will punish us for our audacity and for our sovereignty. What do you say about this threat? Well, um, first of all, we have the example of the financial crisis of 2008 to demonstrate that uh, even if we look just at Europe, the countries that, even countries that are part of the European Union but that didn't join the Euro, uh, countries such as uh, uh, Sweden, but also, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, weaker countries than Austria, such as the Czech Republic and so on, all countries that have their own currency that continue to uh, fluctuate their exchange rate, um, they all uh, uh, suffered um, uh, uh, much less of an impact from the financial crisis and recovered much faster than countries, than a number of countries that were part of the Euro. Uh, of course, you know, again, Italy, Greece, uh, Spain being uh, obvious examples. Uh, whatever parameter we look at, whether it's GDP growth or whether it's unemployment, we see that um, countries that kept their own currency in Europe uh, fared uh, much better through the financial crisis than countries that have uh, the Euro. And that's because um, it's not, um, the Euro doesn't defend countries from uh, financial crises as we saw in 2008 for the simple fact that the European Central Bank is a very strange central bank that, you know, uh, for about uh, four years after the crisis uh, did not intervene uh, to, for example, keep interest rates down and to stop financial markets from speculating against states. It took Mario Draghi four years to make his famous speech where he said, we'll do whatever it takes to save the euro, and that instantly um, collapsed, uh, made the interest rates uh, go down and speculation stopped overnight. And I think the lesson here is, uh, is, is twofold. One, that, um, country, that a central bank uh, can always win against financial markets. The idea that financial markets can uh, control or dictate policies to a country by, uh, you know, speculating on their interest rates, this is just, um, this is simply false. The central bank uh, always has the power to control the interest rate, and it's quite easy to see why. Um, of course, um, you know, the central bank can always say to financial markets, okay, I'm selling these bonds and I'm willing to sell them for this uh, interest rate. You know, I'm willing to sell them for 1%. If you want to buy them, buy them for 1%. Uh, if not, you know, I'll buy them myself. And this is what all the, country, all the developed countries did immediately after the financial crisis. And in fact, avoided speculation on their, uh, on their, on their bonds. Um, on the other hand, the ECB waited four years to intervene. Of course, if you don't have a central bank that intervenes to stop speculation, that's when uh, financial markets are allowed to speculate. So uh, I think you know what's happened over the past decade is a great demonstration of the fact that the euro does not protect us. And uh, the ability to protect yourself from financial speculation has nothing to do with, for example, how much debt you have. We have the example of Japan which has a debt-to-GDP ratio of 250%. And 
That's almost double as Italy. Italy is always, you know, considered to have a massive public debt, and that's why it, uh, you know, that's why it has to uh, be, uh, inf you know, has to uh, be uh, disciplined by financial markets. But Japan has a much higher um, debt to GDP ratio, but uh, has kept interest rates at zero percent for years, and has said we're going to keep interest rates at zero for as long as we like. Um, and so this is how financial markets actually actually work. They're, they they can't dictate policies. To a, to a country, but as an, e an even more interesting example, which is that which is um, that of Africa. Uh, not everyone knows that there's um, that there's kind that that France, ever since the 1940s, has a kind of monetary union with uh, 14 African states, a kind of French euro, and it's existed since the 40s, and it's called a franc uh, CFA. Um, so, 14 African states that have this, uh, you know, strong currency because it's uh, essentially um, uh, it's uh, fixed to the well, it was fixed to the French franc, and now it's fixed to the euro. And uh, so, one one would say, I mean, yes, especially you know these poor, weak African countries, they must need you know a, a strong currency to protect them more than anyone, more than more than a country like Austria, and surely must have fared better in economic terms and in socio-economic terms than, you know, these poor African countries that have their own currencies. Uh, instead, if we look at, you know, uh, all the statistics, you know, in terms of, you know, GDP growth, uh, GDP per capita growth, but also um, access to uh, uh, health uh, care and so on, we see that uh, the countries that are part of the franc CFA are always, uh, are often at the bottom of these uh, statistics. In fact, if we take um, the countries that um, that uh, that, have, that grew the most, that it grew the most in Africa, for example, last year, the ten countries that grew that grew the most, there, there's not a single uh, country that's part of the Franc CFA that's in that um, that's in that, uh, that that's in that chart. Um, and so I think the question, you know, I mean, I think that's the answer. You know, if even you know <laughs> countries as weak uh, uh, and as small as uh, as African countries that have their currency fared better than countries that instead, you know, delegated their monetary policy to France to handle it for them, then uh, I think, you know, that, that's a demonstration that, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, monetary sovereignty and uh, controlling your monetary policy is not a panacea for everything, but it's, uh, it, it's, it tends to be better than delegating your monetary policy to a supranational authority over which you have no control, and it tends to be better to fluctuate your currency than to fix your currency because you know uh, when you fluctuate your currency as most countries in the world do when a crisis hits you can devalue your currency a bit and that helps you to uh, you know become competitive again on the other hand if you don't control that that variable the only way you can become competitive again which is the only way that countries that are part of the eurozone and it's the only way that countries that are part of the franc cfa have to become competitive again is to lower wages and is to lower internal growth. What, what is called internal devaluation. If you can't devalue your currency, the only choice you're left with is internal devaluation, also known as austerity. Um, so uh, I think it's, uh, as I said, it's not a panacea, but it's definitely a better option than delegating your monetary policy to, uh, to a supranational institution. Thank you very much. I think this is a very important answer I maybe sum it up in two German sentences. Uh, Thomas Fazi hat gesagt, uh, die Gefahr der Spekulation uh, des, der Finanzmärkte gegen zum Beispiel eine autonome österreichische Währung, die kann immer gebannt werden, weil eine Zentralbank immer gewinnt gegen die spekulativen Märkte. So Central Bank always wins against speculation. Und uh, er hat auch nochmal klargestellt, wenn man die eigene Währung bindet, so wie im Euro an andere Ökonomien, dann hat man keine Chance im Fall der Krise die eigene Währung abzuwerten und dadurch bessere Wettbewerbsfähigkeit auf den internationalen Märkten zu erreichen. Und wenn man das nicht kann, dann kann man die Wettbewerbsfähigkeit nur noch auf einem anderen Weg erreichen, nämlich durch das Absenken der Löhne. Also entweder senkt man die eigene Währung, wenn man aber keine Währungssouveränität hat, kann man das nicht machen und dann muss man Löhne senken und Einschnitte ins Sozialsystem machen und das nennt man eben Austerität. Das sind die Alternativen. Vielleicht eine one question, maybe uh, still, and then, then we shift to the general public's questions. Um, 
If you say that uh, you, EU countries should return to their own currencies in order uh, not to endanger the European idea in a way, because this mm -hmm. is if I understand exactly what you think to, no? uh, there is a European utopia, but it can better be maintained and pursued by uh, uh, regaining uh, monetary sovereignty uh, in order to create a welfare state and in order to avoid xenophobia, etc., and in order to tackle the big imminent problems. Um, the question would be also, if this is the right solution, is there a kind of dramaturgy that you in, that you envision, uh, I mean, should Austria or could Austria be the first country that takes the step or would that be detrimental? Uh, so, I mean, would, would it be necessary that, for example, Germany or France or Italy would first step out of the euro in order to not to lead this into a catastrophe? Well, <clears throat> um, of course, the ideal solution would be a coordinated dismantling of the euro, where you know, in a in a in a perfect world, you know, I mean, all the countries of the euro would sit around a table and say, "Okay, guys, we've tried it out, but it hasn't worked very well. So let's find the most painless way to dismantle the system and progressively return, you know, and, and you know, have a transitionary period, you know." Um, to, towards you know, a return to national currencies. Now, this would be the ideal way to do it and the most painless way to do it. But it's, it's unlikely to happen for the same reason that a, Europe, that a reform of the European Union is unlikely to happen because it would require uh, the support and the consensus of pretty much all the states, including those states that um, are benefiting from the euro. As I said before, the euro hasn't worked bad for everyone. It's worked quite well. Quite uh, well for uh, Germany, uh, you might think that it worked quite well for Austria. So you might, you might say, no, you know, we don't want to dismantle the euro, and so um, it's unlikely to happen in a coordinated uh, manner. And so again, you know, the the the, the only option I see is, uh, is 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 for one country to take the lead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, and of course that does hold uh, risks and consequences both for the country that leaves and for the rest of the eurozone. But again, I think. Um, Again, I mentioned the franc CFA. Uh, over the years, some African countries have left the franc CFA. Mm -hmm. They've done it. You know, some of them have done it. You know, overnight. Uh, we have examples of monetary unions breaking up. We have, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Czechoslovakia breaking up, and you know, uh, basically forcing <laughs> the two countries that, that that emerged from that breakup to form their own currencies pretty much overnight. We have examples of this being done. And so I think, yes, it would be hard. And yes, breaking up the euro would probably be more detrimental than the, the breakups of these monetary unions that I mentioned. But I think the fact that we're not even able to conceive that is, uh, is I think, a demonstration of the lack of, uh, of imagination, of vision, of courage, I would say, in contemporary politics. Uh, I think the fact that, you know, we're here talking of the euro, but the fact that even the Europe, even the UK, even just the notion that the UK, which is not even part of the euro, could leave the EU, which essentially, I mean, if, if you don't share the same currency, much of the problems are avoided. So what we're talking about is essentially the UK getting out of a free trade agreement. I mean, because that's what, that's what, that's what the EU essentially is, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of very complex free trade agreement. And I think, again, you know, it's, uh, it's a result of, uh, and even that has become this crazy national drama, you know, where it seems that, you know, no one has the courage to defend Brexit. Uh, not even people on the left that I think should support Brexit have the courage to defend Brexit because now it's turned into this, this, this apocalypse that the UK will face if it leaves this free trade agreement and is forced to trade with the EU with the 2% uh, tariffs imposed by the WTO, because that's what we're talking about. And I think it's, um, but I think this is also a result of depoliticization. I think as a result of the European Union, our politicians have stopped, you know, essentially uh, have playing real politics. And what they do is they, they manage a condominium, 
You know, I mean, if everything is managed for you, uh, all you have to do is take care of, yeah, cultural issues. So you think about, you know, uh, you know, you worry about, you know, um, civil rights and gay marriages and all things that are all very important. But it's for, for almost for decades now, mo the, the political class in, in Europe has not had to deal with serious political macroeconomic issues. And so in effect, you know, I mean, it's th th when you've been used to, you know, essentially when you've been used to politics with a, a very small P for so long, to, to have to, you know, play real politics again is, uh, is very scary. And that's also why, for example, you know, uh, even nominally, you know, very people that had a very, like a politician that had a very revolutionary rhetoric, like Alexis Tsipras in Greece, didn't even conceive the most obvious option for Greece, which of course would have been to leave the to leave the euro, um, and so I think yeah that that says a lot about you know kind of the, the state of politics and the result of the of depoliticization. Our politicians are scared of you know making decisions that have consequences, you know, because they haven't had to do that for so long. But of course, that's what politics historically has always been about. It's been about making decisions that have consequences. It's been about taking a side, and it's been about taking risks. But um, you know, uh, this this new generation of politicians doesn't know how to do that anymore. Uh -huh. Okay. Gibt schon ja, es gibt schon Fragen im Publikum. Haben wir ein Saalmikrofon oder sonst gebe ich? Ah ja, wir haben eins. Wunderbar. Da in der ersten Reihe gibt schon Fragen. Thank you. I have a very fast and um, direct question. Uh, why people like you and other bright minds in economy? Uh, are not actually taken into consideration uh, by the political class and by the politicians. So they can, even if they lack vision or they lack courage, they can be helped by you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I mean, everything what I'm listening to, and you give so many examples, and it's just absurd to not be taken into consideration. Do you think it's just that they lack vision and courage, or they are other interests which are way more important behind? Mm -hmm. well, um, well, well, first of all, you know, we come from decades of Tina, there is no alternative. Uh, that's what everyone has been told on the right, on the left, well, more on the left than on the right, you know? The, the, le the right seems to be a bit more brave when it comes to proposing, uh, you know, breaks or alternatives to the status quo, but especially on the left, we've been told that there is an alternative for decades. Um, but politicians in general, everyone's been told that there's an alternative. Uh, and so that's not something you change overnight. Uh, you know, there's very deep-seated uh, notions, you know, about, you know, what, what, what Robert asked, you know, about th this notion that a country that left the euro or that a country with its own currency, you know, would, you know, basically, you know, uh, re return back to the Stone Age or whatever. Uh, th these ideas are very, very deep-seated. So I think that there's an ideological problem, you know, I mean, what we're trying to do is bring new ideas into the debate, you know, and, and it's working. For example, uh, you know, Robert mentioned what's happening in, in the US with MMT. Where, uh, these, Excuse me, uh, this is modern monetary modern, theory. Modern monetary for, theory, <laughs> yeah. where these ideas are finally being discussed in, in mainstream politics in the US with relation to the Green New Deal. Because, uh, you know, again, the, 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 you know, I mean, the, 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 the overarching narrative is that America, arguably the most powerful country in the world, the, country, the, the most sovereign country in the world, can't afford the New Deal. So it's not just a European problem. This is the narrative everywhere. Even in the most powerful country in the world, people have been told for decades that you know, social policies, healthcare for all, you know, uh, a green New Deal necessary to you know, kind of save the world, you know, that we can't afford all these things. Um, and so this is a worldwide problem. And that's one, that's one, so there's an, there's an ideological problem. So even, I think, uh, you know, like people in good faith, people that want to change the world, don't think it's possible. Uh, so there's that problem, and this, this definitely is the case for most people on the left. Very, you know, well-intentioned, but they've internalized this idea that there is no alternative to the current system, and you can only tinker at your edges. Um, 
Then, of course, you have other problems. You have problems of economic, in, you know, economic interests, as you know, I mean, the dominant. This, these systems, these systems didn't emerge, you know, by chance, as I said. You know, I mean, these systems def uphold certain interests in society, and so there's very strong pressures by those interests not to, not, not to change the current situation and to convince people that there is no alternative. So it's not just a theoretical battle. If it were a theoretical battle, it would be easier. But it's, a, it's, a, it's first and foremost a political battle. Uh, you know, getting people to believe that there is no alternative is the easiest way to stay in power. Um, and so, it's, a, so, so it's, it's, it's about politics, it's about class, it's about access to money, access to media. Um, so there's, um, there's, there's, there's that issue. Um, and then, yes, and then I think, so I think these are the two main issues. You know, we come from decades of Tina, and then there's very strong interests that uh, you know want to maintain this system as it is, including, as I said earlier, including the national elites in the countries that have lost out from the euro. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's, it's very easy to, to to buy out politicians nowadays. You know, I mean, because. We, we, in a way, you know, we have sort of two levels of politics, especially in Europe. You've got national politics, and then you've got this supranational politics, where politicians that are uh, that that sort of uh, do what they're expected to do at the national level then are you know uh, amply rewarded with you know positions in the in the European Commission or elsewhere in Brussels or very lucrative positions in private banks and so on and so uh, you know it's, it's it's very easy for national politicians you know not to act in their country's best interest but to act in their own uh, best interest you know I mean uh, one, you know, once upon a time national politicians you know had to had to get you know had to try to maintain consensus to get reelected. Instead, increasingly, you know, they don't care that much about getting reelected because they know, you know, all I got to do is stay in power for one mandate, do what I'm expected to, to do, and then I'm settled for the rest of my life with a nice job, you know, at the European Commission or, or somewhere else. So, so this creates further problems, you know, and it's very hard to uh, to, to 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 break out of this um, of this of this system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> The last, the last point I made, yeah, it's 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 a huge, huge problem. The so-called revolving door between private interests and political interests is uh, is definitely one of the biggest problems we face. It's uh, so hard for a politician to uh, to be true to himself. Even uh, uh, politicians that have that start out with good intentions, uh, you know, it's it's especially you know, I mean, if you know. I mean, you're a working class person, you know, that gets into politics because you believe in politics, you know, and you want to change your country for the best, you know, and then, you know, these people come around and they bring you over to Brussels for a weekend, you know, and they offer you champagne and caviar, you know, and six star hotels, you know, and they say, you know, are you sure you want to, you know, leave the euro, you know, and with all the problems that it might create, or you can just keep your country in the euro, you know, and this is the life you'll have, you know, for the rest of your days. Uh, it's very hard to keep true to your <laughs> to your ideals, even if you started out with good intentions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe I just say one sentence. Exactly the problem you, that you mentioned, and I'm grateful that you asked this question. But just to be not too modest here, I would say what we are doing here is precisely an answer, also or an attempt to answer your problem. And so, I mean, it is remarkable that at least uh, one political academy of an existing party is ready to hear what uh, people like no, Thomas have to say. Things can change very quickly. I mean, I yeah. think that's what the whole modern monetary theory debate shows. And, and of course, it's not just about the debate, but I, I was telling Robert, you know, if you, um, you know, you can, you can search on Google for how many people have searched for a term. And you can see over the years how many people searched for a certain term. And you, search, you, you, you put MMT in, modern monetary theory, and you see it's kind of a flat line for like, 10 years, and then in 2018, when Ocasio Ortiz started speaking about MMT in public, it shoots up, and, it's, and, it, and it keeps growing. And so I think uh, one interesting thing about the times that we live in is that um, you know, it also allows change to happen much more rapidly than, than before. You know, social media and the internet you know, can really create these 
accelerations that would have been impossible uh, before where you had to sort of work your way over the years, you know. Now, you know, I mean, if you, if you, if you manage to put your foot into the system, like, for example, you know, these young dem democratic um, senators have done, then you can really shift the paradigm uh, very quickly because it's, it's, once you get on the mainstream media, it's much harder to ignore you. At that point, they have to debate it with you. They'll try to attack you. But of course, the most important thing is getting in the mainstream media because obviously the most powerful weapon they have is to ignore you. Yeah. Uh, you know, once they have to attack you, you know, you're already uh, a good part of the struggle is already won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other imminent questions? I don't see hands raised. Ah, yeah, please. Um, you mentioned uh, European demos. Um, wouldn't you say that going back to national currencies would be a step back to establishing a European demos? Well, uh, well no, my point is that uh, I mean, I think it, my point is that at the moment there is not a European demos. I mean, I think that we, Europe lacks some basic conditions to have a democratic discourse. You know, I mean, like a common language. You know, European newspapers. We, there's not even a European debate. You know, uh, uh, so at the moment we're lacking we're lacking that. And I think one could move towards you know a much more. Uh, one, we can st I think we can construct the European demos over time. But, um, and I think going back to national currencies would, would actually favor uh, the construction of the European demos. I mean, you know, the first thing to do is put an end to these resentments and the hostilities that the euro is creating between countries. You know, I mean, as long as, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the euro has exacerbated national lines. I mean, as long as Greeks, you know, think of, uh, you know, uh, Germans as Nazis, and as long as the Germans think of the Greeks as a bunch of lazy people that don't want to work, I mean, I think it's quite obvious that no demos is ever gonna, gonna emerge, you know, so, so to overcome these divisions that the euro is creating, I think the first step is, you know, dismantling the euros, you know, uh, is dismantling the euro. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, I mean, th th as I said, you know, the euro is exacerbating the national narratives. It's not helping us overcome those narratives. Um, and so going back to national currencies, you know, <laughs> uh, which means that, you know, I mean, Greeks wouldn't, you know, blame the Germans for their problems and Germans wouldn't blame the Greeks for, you know, wanting to steal their money. I think that would be a first step towards, you know, uh, the emergence of a common uh, uh, sort of pan-European identity, you know. But I think it's quite, it's quite a long, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a long way, uh, you know, I think we're talking, you know, I mean, generations. Uh, so I think we've got to distinguish between solutions, you know, <laughs> short-term solutions that, you know, can help us in our lifetime and longer-term solutions, you know, that might take generations. I think we need to separate the two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Wollten Sie nachfragen? Okay, thank you. Maybe... Uh, it would be good to ask one other question uh, that does not so much concern the question how could uh, the left and the progressive center win, but also the question what if we win? And you are. <laughs> so, uh, if, yeah. <laughs> if you say that. Uh, uh, the basic line of the argument was back to national currency in order to make a new Keyn Keynesian policy possible again, uh, a state that creates uh, money, that a state that creates jobs and employment. Uh, the question in that case would be, if, if we could achieve that, is Keynesianism not still an economic paradigm who, which is centered on the notion of growth. So uh, what, what can we tell about uh, Keynesianism to the demonstrating little school children all over Europe who say you are taking away our future, uh, if they say we must stop growth? Uh, is Keynesianism a solution for the problem of a future zero growth society? I think it, it absolutely is. Uh, if by Keynesian we mean, you know, uh, public investment and, uh, you know, a greater 
public control of the economy. I mean, uh, all the studies show that to avert disastrous climate change, we need to radically transform our systems of production, of consumption, and so on. And who, who, who else is supposed to implement these changes if not states, if not public institutions? I mean, if we wait for the markets to implement these changes, we're doomed. They're never going to do it. Markets, you know, search for, you know, far, you know fast profits. That's, that's what they're designed for. And so I think, um, I think we need to go beyond Keynesianism. I see Keynesianism as a transitionary, uh, as a set of tools necessary to transition towards a completely different model, which, um, which I would call socialism, uh, democratic socialism. I think nowadays, more than ever, uh, the notion of the need for uh, collective democratic control of the economy is greater than ever, simply because markets have become a threat to really the survival of life on, on Earth, I think. So uh, today, I think the question of, uh, of planning, of, of democratic control of the economy, uh, of, of taking into the public hand uh, large sectors of the economy, uh, including the energy sector, the transportation sector, and so on, uh, which are not that radical, these are not so radical proposals. This is how, how it used to be in a number of countries, you know, up to the 70s, and it still is the case in some countries. Um, so I think, you know, uh, the, the, tool, the, the tools that Keynesianism provides us with are absolutely crucial, I would say, to guaranteeing the survival of, uh, of, life, on the, of life on the planet. Today, I would say that, you know, uh, democratic socialism has become really a kind of civilizational uh, imperative. Uh, I don't see any other solution to, uh, to the crisis that we're facing. And I would add that, you know, because people say, oh, but if it's a global problem, so we have to solve it at the global level, it's the same argument that I make for the EU. Yeah. Ideally, yes, would it, be, would it be nice to have a, a, an enlightened world government, you know, that forces countries to transition towards a no-carbon economy and so on? Okay, you know, I mean, it might be good. But A, you know, is it, is it ever going to emerge? And, uh, you know, of course it's never going to emerge. And if it does emerge, it's never going to be democratic. It's never going to be democratic. It's never going to be enlightened. Um, and so, again, I think democracy is required to implement these changes. Because, as I said, the elites, the people in power, have an interest in maintaining the, the system as it is or, 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 or sort of deviating these protests towards... Uh, mild reforms that don't change the relate balance of power uh, in the world. And so if we need democracy to, uh, to force these policies onto our politicians, then that means that, you know, the only, again, the only instrument, the only tool we have to do that is the, is the, national, is the national state. And, uh, and I think, you know, this notion that a lot of people on the left have that, oh, but, you know, we need a global approach to these problems, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, global approaches... Doesn't, don't exist. What, we, what exists are individual states, and what exists are individual states through which we can, uh, you know, force uh, changes upon uh, upon our politicians. You know, I mean, uh, it, you know, countries that still have their monetary sovereignty, of course, not <laughs> not us. But um, no, but I mean, I think uh, I think that's that's fundamental, and I think you know, it's much more inspiring for a, a single country to do to show that you know, an alternative way is possible, then for the left to keep repeating, oh, we need to change things at the global level, you know, which at the end of the day uh, simply feeds uh, defeatism and uh, cynicism. Thomas, thank you very much. I think you told us what to do and you told us how to do it. I think this is more than one, expect, one can expect from one evening. Uh, I thank you uh, very much. I thank, thank you, you from the audience. Uh, we have another question. I couldn't see that, sorry, the, the light uh, prevented me from <laughs> seeing the question, yeah. So sorry, but uh, the European Commission has submitted some papers concerning a plan of uh, low carbon and uh, so-called green financing with tax possibilities, transparency, justly to imply this on the national, on the members of the European Union member states of the European Union. Uh, the paper came out, I think, in February. From the, and I think that's already at least one approach. But we know that the meals of the European Union are slow. But how you see, for example, this paper as 
a begin of a solution? No, I don't see it as a solution at all. I mean, if you, it sounds good, but if you look at the details, what they're proposing is, you know, uh, again, the, what they're saying is, uh, you know, we need to invest, I think they said, 100 billion euros in a year in, you know, or something like that, you know, to avert disastrous climate change. And the next phrase is that, but of course we don't have that money. <laughs> so we have to, you know, try to get it from capital markets and we have to raise it, you know, on capital markets and we have to hope that, you know, uh, we can tax rich people. Otherwise, you know, I'm sorry, the, the world is doomed. So I think, you know, they're completely stuck within that paradigm. And so, you know, I mean, if, if that's your approach, then, you know, you, you've already lost. I mean, if, uh, you know, I think, uh, and I think that, that, that's why the debate that they're having in America is so different. In America, in America they're talking of uh, in, an, an investment in, in the area of trillions of dollars, not a hundred billion dollars, uh, euros, uh, trillions of dollars. Uh, and of course there the debate is, you know, also thanks to people like Ocasio-Ortez that are bringing these issues into the public domain, the quite now they're debating, you know, how much should we finance it through, you know, money creation, through money creation by the central bank? How much should we finance it through taxes? Uh, you know, these these are the kind of this is the kind of debate that that's going on in America, and that's the kind of debate that would be impossible to have at the European level. You know, I mean, to to, 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 to for the ECB to even take into consideration, you know, the notion that it would have to, you know, create trillions of euros, you know, to finance a green new deal, which was you know, which of course would be totally technically feasible. Uh, you know, when people when people hear us propose, you know, the notion that, for example, public services should be financed through money creation by the central bank, people instantly think, oh, hyperinflation, oh, you're crazy. But in fact, you know, this is what the ECB has already been doing in the context of quantitative easing. You know, the ECB has created out of nothing, out of thin air, about 2.5 trillion euros. Uh, since 2015. But of course it's used that money, you know, to prop up banks and to prop up the financial system. Of course they could, you know, it could have taken 2.5 trillion euros and invested it into a Green New Deal. But it's just, it, it's, it goes counter to everything, you know, to the ideology that is, you know, uh, I would say structural to the, to the system and, and th that's not gonna, that's not gonna change. Mm -hmm. We've got another question, please. Yeah, the really last question, and maybe it would be, it is a bit thumb, but why don't the right-wing parties don't use modern monetary theory for their argumentation? Is it because of their nationalism? Because they think nation, uh, Austria is better than other countries? Or is it the aspect of equality in Europe? So why right-wing parties don't use yes. mon modern monetary theory? Um, well, I mean, well, for, I mean, for the same goes for what for what I said earlier. I mean, uh, well, I think in a way, in a way, they do. I mean, I think in a way, when you look at not so much right-wing parties, but for example, um, you know, so establishment parties. Now, just look at how much you know how much money was spent to save the banks uh, after the financial crisis. That's modern monetary theory, in a way. Oh, okay, yeah, well, I think the, 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 the amount of money that the European, I think the European Commission uh, approved that not all that money was spent. But I think just for the saving of the banks in Europe, the European Commission, the same one that says to Italy, oh no, you know, you have to keep your deficit down because you can't give a bit more money to poor people, you know, because you know, otherwise you're going to go bankrupt. That same European Commission in 2009, I think, approved 4.5 trillion euros of money for saving the banks. And so we go back to the issue of, uh, you know, a lot of the time, they, some of these establishment politicians know how the system works, uh, and they use that system to further their own interests. You know, when it comes to saving the banks, no one screams hyperinflation, no one screams, oh, you're gonna go bankrupt, you know? They just write a check for whatever sum is necessary. Uh, even in Italy, you know, I mean, I think, you know, what, uh, where, for example, our parliament now has been debating for months, you know, on where to find the money for this uh, income support program that the government wants to do, you know, we need, you know, three euros from here, four euros from there. Even our government, I think, approved 
uh, a 20 billion bailout for a bank that was failing just overnight. Even the Italian government that supposedly doesn't have money, you know, <laughs> scrambling for euros, you know, when it, when, when, it, when it was about saving a single bank, they approved 20 billion euros just like that overnight. And so, you know, that, that's modern monetary theory, you know, yeah. And, um, and it was a really interesting article, again, on, 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 on the Green New Deal. I think it was in a, a mainstream newspaper, I think it was in Financial Times. And, uh, and this guy said, look, it's not about, you know, we don't have to transition to modern monetary theory, especially in the US. The US already operates according to the principles of modern monetary theory. What I said earlier, whenever they have to uh, fund a war, the US just prints the money. Where do people think the US finds the money? The trillions and trillions and trillions of euros that were needed to finance you know, the destruction of half the world over the past 20 years. They, they print the money. They, they literally print it. In fact, there's, there's, it's really interesting, there's like every year, uh, I don't know, like a couple of trillion dollars disappear from the Pentagon's budget. Like, it's really interesting. If you look it up, Pentagon budget trillions. Uh, every year, like from the, they, they do their account, <laughs> account statements at the end of the year, and they can't account for a few trillion dollars, you know, which of course disappear into various I don't know, unofficial programs. And that's money that's created out of thin air. And so, as this guy in the Financial Times said, you know, <coughs> You, you only need to find money, you only need to raise taxes when it's about helping poor people, when it's about funding healthcare, when it's about funding schools. Then, you know, politicians start to squabble about, you know, who should we tax? And uh, when it's about funding wars, they just, you know, I mean, nowadays you don't even have to print money. It's just, you know, they just, you know, just cli you know, click on a computer and, uh, and you can create as much money as you want. And that's, that's how they fund the wars, but it's not how they... You know, they won't do the same thing to fund healthcare and jobs and things that will actually improve our, 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 our conditions. So, uh, so I think that's, that's part of the answer, you know. I mean, often they, they know how the system works and they use it to their advantage, but they pretend they don't know how it works because if people realized, uh, you know, just how big the lie is that they've been told, you know, God knows what would happen, you know. Uh, uh. <laughs> Um, maybe in order to, to make your point clear, one would, I think, have to state that uh, the right, uh, what the right does or what the American government does can be explained by modern monetary theory. But of course, saving the banks in Greece was not what modern monetary theory would recommend. It's not the strategy for solving the problems that they apply. Huh? Well, yeah, I, mean, I think it's, modern monetary theory is not a political program. It simply explains how the system works. And then you can use that system to fund wars or to save the banks or you can use that system to fund the Green yeah. New Deal. Yeah. It's just a, a, a theoretical, theoretical, it's a practical framework for how the system works. And in order just to give one idea to uh, your question, I think what one can observe is that rightist political forces are forces that always profit from their own political mistakes. Yeah? The, that this is the secret of how they live. You know? For example, an Israeli rightist government lives on uh, not solving the problem of peace with their neighbors. Yeah? They, they definitely do not do anything in order to solve and to achieve peace with the Palestinians because as long as they have war, uh, they will be re-elected. Yeah? And, and you have this, that on every level. On European Union level, you have it, for example, uh, what you said with the ecological problem reminded me of uh, the European credit transfer system problem created by the European Union that was uh, intended to allow uh, or to make more easy because it, uh, it existed already student exchanges between European universities. No? We were already uh, quite successfully exchanging European students between European universities and then Brussels invented uh, uh, the European credit transfer system for European uh, students, and that made it much, much more difficult to exchange students. But a lot of people lived on this system. Every university had to engage uh, people, bureaucrats, in order to make the system run. So a lot of bureaucrats uh, live on precisely this system never getting to run, because we are now implementing it for 20 years. And you can imagine that they will definitely not solve the problems in order to, to keep the problem run. Yeah? And so I think uh, 
the same goes on with the Freedom Party in Austria. Yeah? Uh, it's not, uh, I mean, the prob one of the problems that they live on is that uh, there are difficulties to integrate refugees into Austrian society. Yeah? And they will do the devil in order to, to solve that problem because they live on the non-resolution of that problem. So I think this is what the left has also to... Uh, to envision that there is a very good solution for the right in not solving problems. And a leftist strategy would be the opposite, and that's why it's always a little more difficult to, to be a leftist than a rightist. <laughs> I think we have come to a point uh, where it's time to say thank you, especially to you, thank Thomas. You. Thank you very much for your inspiring and intriguing talk. Thank you, you, the audience, for your vivid interest. And special thanks to Alexandra Ötzlinger, my agent, who has organized this lecture series and has done everything that, in very, very short time, most brilliant people and most brilliant voices uh, could be heard in Austria, so that, as you mentioned it, uh, politicians could maybe listen to the voices of uh, competent experts. Thank you very much for this evening, and individual questions can maybe be raised now in the aftermath uh, over a glass of wine. Thank you very much. Thank you.